you had a fairly recent brush with mortality and um, was an anxious moment for all your many friends, I can tell you, uh, and, and came out of it with, with some splendid thoughts. Well, yes, uh, my aorta burst, but fortunately I got wonderful care now. I have an artificial uh, aorta. And a lot of people wondered if this was going to change my mind about, about whether or not I believed in God or believed in an afterlife, and absolutely not. But I did, I did have a, 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 an epiphany of sorts. I realized that, first of all, I was, of course, tremendously relieved to be alive and, and very much buoyed up by all the affection and support I got from family and friends all over. Uh, and I realized that when I said, thank goodness, I didn't just mean that as a euphemism for thank God. I really meant thank goodness. The reason that I was still alive was because of all the goodness technological goodness, medical goodness, just good-hearted people, really wonderful, caring, love, lovely people. And all of that had, was what saved my life. And I was very grateful. And then I realized what I can do with that gratitude is pay it back. I can try to create some more goodness. I can add to the supply of goodness in the world. We don't need a middleman. Why, why? Yes, I love that phrase, we don't need a middleman. That, that's... Why thank God? Why not yes. thank God's creatures? Why not yes. thank the doctors? Why yes. not thank the nurses? Yes. Why not thank the, the, the medical journals that, that peer reviewed the, the, the technologies that, that were so beautifully honed so that they could save my life? There's a lot of goodness in the world, and I'm very glad there is. I wouldn't be here if they weren't, and now I can try to do my share to add a little goodness directly back into it. So don't bother praying, go plant a tree, go yes. teach somebody well, I was something. was particularly impressed in that I read... I there's, there, there are some differences, of course. Um, it's interesting that Judaism has had almost no speciation, uh, uh, individuation into, into different groups, just a little bit, whereas uh, uh, Protestantism just just hundreds, thousands of different little independent Protestant churches. Um, and, and an especially interesting case, of course, is, is Mormonism, or a uh, Church of uh, Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, where we can, I think, identify the feature that enables the splitting. And that goes back to the original founders and the idea that in Mormonism, God speaks to everybody. You don't have to go through the leader, the elder of the church. You can, you can hear God's voice yourself. And what's happened over the years, every now and then, when a, an elder in the, church, uh, uh, in the Mormon church decides, when, or when the, 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 the group of elders, I don't know what they call themselves, decide on a new policy, as they did recently, not so long ago, when they decided that you know, uh, blacks were actual people and could become members of the church, uh, there's always other Mormons who, they listen and God doesn't agree with what they've just heard, so they form a new sect. And of course, very often what God tells these people, and it's always men, is what God really wants you to do is to take that cute little 14-year-old girl next door and marry her. And so you get a pattern of sects forming where Polygamy comes back in in a big way because that's what God's told them to do. I think it only undermines a, a, a crutch that, that they don't need, and that's the crutch of an absolute, say, an immortal soul, an immaterial immortal soul. That's an idea that a lot of people think is very important. Uh, and what it does, of course, is it replaces it with the idea of a material mortal soul. Yeah, we have souls, but they're made of neurons. And the little neurons individually are just blind little bio-robots. They don't know, they don't care, they're just doing their jobs. The amazing thing is that if you put enough of them together in the right sort of teams, you have basically a soul. You have the, the control system and the memory of a being that can be held responsible, that can hold himself or herself responsible, that can look into the future. And because we can look into the future because we can imagine the world in a better way. 
we can hold each other responsible for that in a way no other species can. Now, traditionally, the idea is God implants that soul in us. But we don't have to see it that way. We can see that the soul itself, the human soul, is itself a product of natural selection and both genetic natural selection and cultural selection. And that's why we are responsible for the future of the planet in a way no other species is. One that's been interesting me more recently is how a number of, of social institutions depend on the ignorance of those that they, that they exploit. Whether it's a Ponzi scheme where the individual investors are sort of almost complicit in their ignorance of what's going on because it's not worth their while to be too inquisitive about what's going on until it's too late. And in particular, uh, uh, religions. I think that perhaps the single most important change in the world as far as religion is concerned is electronic communication. The internet and cell phones, transistor radios for that matter, going back a little bit. For thousands of years, religions thrived in an environment where information was hard to come by and it was, you could more or less assume that individual members of each group were not only ignorant of other religions, but even ignorant of a lot of their own religion's history and practices. And this easily maintained ignorance was, I think, sort of the lifeblood of, of religious solidarity. Our bodies are composed of maybe even a hundred trillion cells, and they cooperate pretty well. The, the human ones are only about 10% of those, and the rest are all visitors of one sort or another. And just take your human cells, the ones that have your genome. The body never has to worry about, you know, your thumbs learning something and then rebelling and <laughs> deciding to abandon ship. Um, they, they are on a, their, their life mission has been determined in development from, from the moment that they were born of, of uh, became the daughter cell of some mother cell. And they don't have any wherewithal to learn about the outside world and wonder whether or not maybe life would be better if they were not quite so cooperative. And religions were like that. Religions could rely on, and notice when I say rely on, there's nobody doing this relying. It's, this is the religion itself that is designed by natural selection in such a way as to presuppose the relative ignorance of the parts that make it up. You don't have to go to special lengths to shield the parts from information. Now that's all changed. It's changed hugely. And I think every religion in the world is on the cusp of either going extinct or transforming itself in ways that are really radical. It, there's no other option. They simply will not be able to continue with the information that is now readily available. They can, they can do the, the sort of religious equivalent of Bashar al-Assad and you, you know, <laughs> enslave the people, imprison the people, kill the people, but if you're not prepared to put all the people basically in prison, they're going to get the information, and that's going to change everything. So my prescription for what we should be doing is very firmly but gently informing, informing, informing. Letting people all over the world know about each other's religions and letting them mull those facts over. And if the leaders of those religions have to revise their practices to account for the fact that this is happening, they're going to transform religions in ways that are well, hard to imagine, but I think largely favorable.
And uh, notice that no matter what religion you are, if you are one, uh, in this audience, I don't suppose there are probably that many that, that do have a religion, but whatever religion you have, it's the minority. So that more people don't want it to sweep to fixation than want it to sweep to fixation. You might reflect on what that means about the future of this planet. But of course, that's just one scenario. This is not working as well as it should. Um, another one is that religion is in its death throes. Contrary to what others have said, what we're seeing now are the paroxysms, the dying gasps of religion. And maybe in the lifetime of your own grandchildren, the Vatican City will become the European Museum of Roman Catholicism. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Mecca will become Disney's Magic Kingdom of Allah. <laughs> it seems a little unlikely, I know. but. But bear in mind that the Hagia Sophia, it started off as a church, then it became a mosque, and today it's a museum. It's worth remembering. So, but there's two hypotheses. Here's another one. Maybe religions are going to change. They're going to transform themselves into sort of creedless moral teams with pageantry, with songs, with traditions, with colors. And they may specialize in one moral effort or another, but you know, leaving out the creeds. Maybe it'll all be just sort of evolving pageantry. That's another prospect. It might happen. Who knows? Another possibility might be that religion will simply sink into the background. It will diminish in prestige and visibility rather like smoking. And that although right now it's very high status to be very religious, it may be maybe the religious people will be, will be sort of like the people huddled out in the rain outside buildings, you know, uh, having their cigarettes. <laughs> Seems unlikely, but then there's another prospect to consider. Then, of course, there's one more prospect to consider, and that is Judgment Day arrives. <laughs> now, oddly enough, or not so oddly, according to Newsweek magazine, the majority of Americans believe this one. 57% according to a recent poll. It's worth reflecting on that. Let's go back 10,000 years to the dawn of agriculture. At that point, human beings around the world were beginning to domesticate animals and plants, of course. And at that point, our species, Homo sapiens, and these are, of course, entirely modern Homo sapiens. At that point, 10,000 years ago, if you put them on one side of a balance scale, together with their pets and livestock, all the domesticated vertebrates on one side, including us, and you put all the rest of the terrestrial vertebrates on the other side, animals, not the insects, not the worms, not the fish. He calculated that at that time, 10,000 years ago, we and our livestock accounted for a fraction of 1% by weight of the terrestrial vertebrate biomass. What do you think the percentage is today? Any guesses? 10 percent. Over 50. 99, are you kidding? No, it's 98. It is 98. We human beings have engulfed the planet. This is one of the most astonishing biological phenomena that has ever happened. And here's what Paul said about this. Over billions of years on a unique sphere, chance has painted a thin covering of life, complex, improbable, wonderful, and fragile. Suddenly, we humans have grown in population, technology, and intelligence to a position of terrible power, we now wield the paintbrush. I've highlighted the technology and intelligence because those are the thinking tools. The only difference between us and our ancestors of 100,000 years ago is the thinking tools. We got the same genes, we got pretty much the same digestive systems, the same muscles, the thinking tools, the same brains. The thinking tools have changed us and made all of this power possible. It is the, the source of our power. 
which raises a sort of chicken egg problem. Did evolved tools make us smarter, or did we evolve to become smart enough to make tools? And like all good chicken and egg questions, the answer is yes. <laughs> it's a co-evolutionary bootstrapping process where you have a little evolution, uh, makes us smarter, and then we can be smarter about making tools. We be can become self-conscious about the tools we make. Our ancestors weren't self-conscious. They didn't invent words. They didn't coin words. They just found themselves using words, and it made them smarter. God is very definitely beyond the verification process of science. God has been designed to be beyond the verification process of science. This is one of the, one of the, the classic adaptations of religions, is to, is to create this gulf so that, so that science can't get anywhere near God. That's true. But science can understand that very fact. You say that well, science, can under, science can understand how religions evolved and why, by the way, that idea is completely absent in folk religions, which are the ancestors. The idea of, the idea of God being, as it were, beyond science. They don't make a distinction between science and religion. The folk religions, it's all the same. It's all one. This is just what everybody knows. And they have no concept of faith. They don't need a concept of faith. It's only once you start getting this separation between science and other things that people think they know when maybe they don't, that's when the idea of faith looms and becomes a very attractive idea. And indeed it is. It protects the idea of God from disproof. You are grandparents, many grandparents here? Yeah, sure. It's great having grandchildren. How many of you think that the most important thing in your life is having more grandchildren than your next door neighbor? <laughs> No, but we're the only species that has that attitude. We're the only species that can have something for our sumum bonum other than the genetic imperative. How is that possible? Where did we find the elbow room? Where did we find the leverage to break out of that pattern and trans transcend our genetic imperative and come to think of other things as even more important than having more offspring? And the answer is obvious. It's culture. It's having ideas to die for. How did that happen? It's ideas, not worms, that hijack our brains. And these are ideas that replicate in competition with each other. They're what Richard Dawkins calls memes. That's, of course, from his book, The Selfish Gene. Memes, according to Dawkins, are analogous to genes. They are the, they are the replicating informational items and we can consider their fitness. So we have selfish memes in addition to selfish genes. It's not the case that we like honey because it's sweet. It's rather more the case that honey is sweet because we like it. That's putting it a little crudely. But let me, let me just spell it out a little better than that. Here's, a very, here's the, the, the pre-Humean, pre-Darwinian idea. First, there was sweetness, and then we evolved to like sweetness. No, that's just wrong. That's just getting it backwards. That's the pre-Darwinian vision. Sweetness was born with the evolved wiring that made us want it. So, there's glucose. Theorizing about sweetness by looking very carefully at the structure of glucose <laughs> is hopeless. You won't find the sweetness in the structure of glucose. It's not there. It's not an intrinsic property of glucose. You won't find the sweetness out there. You need to study the brain and the evolution of the brain to understand the existence of sweetness. Sweetness exists because glucose is high quality energy and any organism that has a preference and is willing to devote some time and energy to acquiring this is on the right track. That's why honey is sweet. That's why glucose is sweet. Sweetness is the effect, not the cause, of our desire for sweet things. 
So let's just look at the pre-inverted history, the, the old-fashioned, the mistaken history. God sees that we should adore glucose. So he sprays glucose with sweetness fog. <laughs> which causes people to experience sweetness. Which causes them to decide they love those sweet things with all that glucose in them, with all the sweetness fog on it. And that's how God made sugar sweet. No. There is one cause too many. Cancel the sweetness fog. We don't need the sweetness fog. God cut, cut to the chase. He simply arranged for glucose to trigger the label desire, the sweet yummy desire label, which was wired up to initiate, provoke, and intensify the getting behavior, and he's home free. It's just as Hume said about causation. We project the experience onto the sweet things and think, ooh, they have this intrinsic property of sweetness, which we just love. And it causally explains our desire for it, why we appreciate it. No, there's nothing out there in the glucose by itself intrinsically that causally explains why we like it. That's getting the order of explanation backwards. This is, I would say, a benign user illusion. We know what sexy is for. It rewards us for all the time and effort spent mating. Now, it's a dirty job, but somebody's got to do it. There's nothing intrinsically sexy about this, which is a good thing, because if there were, evolution would have a problem. How to get chimps to mate. <laughs> well, here's one possible solution. Hallucination. <laughs> but there's a simpler way. Just wire up the chimps to love that look, which they apparently do. No intrinsic sexiness, just being wired up to Go for the right sorts of things for your kind. Another inversion. It stands to reason that we adore babies because they are cute. And again, it's the same sort of thing. This is, and be, we think in, in, uh, naively that because we find them cute, we want to cuddle them and care for them. Whereas, in fact, it's because we want to care for them and cuddle them that we categorize them as cute. It seems to me that those people who have their faith, who believe so strongly in God, if they really believe strongly in their God, if they believe they're right, they believe that they, they, are, they occupy the moral high ground, they should be only too willing to sit down and put this, not to the scientific test, but to the political moral discussion test of talking about why they believe what they believe, and let's talk about the main thing we want to talk about is what should we do? What, what's the moral course of action to take? And if that is to be a reasonable discussion, we have to take a few cards off the table. Such as? The faith card. Well, we have to take the faith card off the table. What do you mean take the faith card off the table? I mean, if, 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 if one is a man of faith, <laughs> one can't take, the, can't take the gene out. Well, you know, Lucille says you're wrong. You, you know who Lucille is? Mm -mm. She's a friend of mine. She's always right. I can't play that card in an argument. If I, it's just rude of me to say, you know, Lucille says you're wrong. You say, well, who's Lucille? I say, well, friend of mine, always right. But we're End of the discussion. But, but we're confronted today by people who say they know the mind of God. And, and I think the, scripture and to I reveal think, it. And I think the way we should deal with them is to say, well, that's very interesting because now you've got a real problem. Since the rest of us don't know the mind of God, we can't share your, uh, your direct line, so you're going to have to do the best you can in a secular discussion about what the right thing to do is. You Are you up to the task of explaining to the rest of us who don't have your hotline to God why you're right? And how did all this originate? And the answer to that is, well, it originated all fairly recently. By geological or biological standards, religion is very young. It's only been around for maybe tens of thousands of years. It's younger than language, and that's been around hard to say.
Some people think a million years, some people think a few hundred thousand years. Agriculture is 10,000 years old. The oldest known organized religion, Judaism, is only 2,000 years old. There's no, there's no well-known, well-understood religion that we can go back more than about 3,000 years. That's, that's very young, and, and of course a lot of the religions are much younger. Uh, the Mormons, very recent religion. And we know that religions are born, sects are born every day. The websites can't keep up with them. Most of them last a few weeks or a few months or maybe a year or two and then go extinct. We don't know how many thousands, how many tens of thousands of religions have come and gone in the last hundred thousand years. Maybe it's millions, gone without a trace. But some have survived and flourished and leave a very big footprint on the world. And the question is why? What is it about them as natural phenomena that's permitted them to have the staying power, the stamina, the robustness, the growth. These are questions that you can ask as a, as a historian, as a, as a, as a theologian, as a, as a psychologist, as an archaeologist. You can also ask them as a biologist. This is, these facts are perfectly visible to the natural sciences. It's hard to know whether the natural sciences can do anything to study them. I want to say, in fact, they can. These are, these are good questions that a biologist should scratch his or her head about and see what they come up with. Not just biologists, but biologists among others. Uh, compare these two artifacts. On the left we see a termite castle, on the right Gaudi's La Sagrada Familia. Very similar in appearance and actually very similar in internal structure too. They're quite remarkably similar. Although they look very similar, they are the products of two hugely different processes of design and production. We have mindless little termites on the one hand who don't know what they're doing. There's no boss termite. There's no architect termite. They just do their mindless, uncomprehending little thing and this wonderful structure emerges. On the other, we have Gaudi, the sort of paradigmatic intelligent designer with blueprints and manifestos and ordering everybody around. So we have top-down versus bottom-up design and construction in this case, yielding rather similar products. Now, there is a reason why the termite does what it does, but it's not the termite's reason. The termite doesn't have a reason for what it's doing. Gaudi, on the other hand, had reasons why he did what he did. Yesterday in the morning, uh, we heard of uh, Hugo Mercier's uh, suggestion that reasoning is attending to reasons. Gaudi attends or attended to reasons. That's reasoning. The termites don't attend to reasons at all. And yet there are reasons for the structures that they build what I call free-floating rationales, a term which I now somewhat regret, although it's been many years I've been using it, because it strikes terror and, and disgust, nausea in many minds. I felt wrongly so. They expect that I'm making some weird mystical claim, not at all. Um, trees do things for reasons. Fungi do things for reasons. Bacteria do things for reasons. The biotic world is saturated with reasons from the molecular scale on up. That's how we can reverse engineer it all. There's reasons why the parts are organized the way they are. There's reasons why these things behave as they do. The things are just the beneficiaries of those reasons. They're not the reasoners. Trees don't reason. They don't have to reason. They are designed to do things. The reason they do the things, are they're clueless about that, and that's just fine. My new motto about this is competence without comprehension. It is the fundamental, both Darwinian and, what do you say, Turingian? Turing had the same idea, and they're very, very closely related ideas, that invert everything and understand that comprehension is not the source of competence. It is an effect of multiple competences piled on top of each other in interesting ways. 
We do things for reasons. We shrink, we, we shiver, we vomit, we blink for reasons that we don't have to know. Then there's the things we do for reasons where we have the reasons. Big difference. These free-floating rationales are, you might say, design features of living things. Well, <laughs> and already I know that some people are going to be very design features. This isn't really design, it's only apparent design. That's what a lot of people want to say. Uh, even my good friend Richard Dawkins, who proposes that we use the word designoid as a term for biological entities, uh, meaning it's just apparent design. Well, I beg to differ. Um, I have another use for the word designoid, apparent design. I say evolved design is real design. Apparent design just looks like design. Let me give you some examples so you can see the contrast. When cartoonists like Sidney Harris do blackboards covered with very impressive formulae, that's designoid. So, you know, this. However, it's excellent pseudoscience. We're supposed to understand that this is very deep stuff on the blackboard, but it's just gobbledygook. Or how about this one? Whatever happened to elegant solutions? <laughs> now, now, that's designoid. The design in nature isn't apparent design. It's very real design. Because it really does stuff and it does it excellently. It is design without a designer. Now, some people want to say that's just contradictory. Yeah, like an atom that can be split. <laughs> if we learn that atoms can be split, even in spite of the etymology which says they can't, we can get used to the idea of design without a designer in the sense of an intelligent designer. It is designed because you can reverse engineer it. Why is this of such concern to you, uh, Dan? Uh, if, if my faith doesn't pick your pocket or break your bone, as Thomas Jefferson said, yeah. why should you care what I believe? Well, exactly. I, uh, I wouldn't accept that religious people care so much about what everybody else believes. Why do they care? Why do Christians care what Muslims believe? Why do Muslims care what Christians believe? And to me, the really dangerous thing about religion, and this is not everybody, of course, it's, it's not half, thank goodness but it's many, and that is the one thing that I think is really dangerous in many religions is that it gives people a gold-plated excuse to stop thinking. To stop thinking? To stop thinking, to say, I don't have to think about that because my religion says this is right, this is wrong, it's as clear as that, it's black and white, I don't have to think about this anymore. It's just a matter of faith, well, and, this, and we honor that. We say, oh, it's a matter of faith. I think we have to stop honoring people for stopping thinking. How many grandparents have we got out there? <coughs> a lot, yeah. How many of you think that the most important thing in life is having more grandparents, grandchildren, having more grandchildren than your neighbors? <laughs> <laughs> Not a single hand goes up. That's a stupendous biological fact. There is no other species on the planet that does not have that as its ultimate sumum bonum. Those swant salmon swimming upstream, they can't think, you know, I'd really rather study French literature, you know, the heck. <laughs> Kids, forget it. Yeah. No, we're the only species that has found the sort of conceptual leverage to see other prospects of this sort. This is an amazing fact about us. René Descartes in the 17th century was the, really the founder of thinking about consciousness in the brain. And his theory said there's actually two distinct substances. There's the mind and then there's the brain. And the brain is a physical, mechanical system, material system, and the mind well, he didn't say it floated nearby, but he might as well say that. He, he never could quite say where it was. But what happens is that, uh, here's his diagram, the uh, uh, 
light bounces off that arrow on the right into the man's eyes, which causes uh, the nerves to jangle, which causes cerebral, spinal cerebral fluid to uh, get uh, vibrate, which causes the pineal gland to do what? Well, to send a mysterious immaterial signal to the soul. The pineal gland was Descartes Bluetooth to the soul. <laughs> and then the soul, having decided of its own free will to point at the arrow, sends another Bluetooth signal back to the body, and that gets the arm to raise to point to the arrow. Now this is a hopeless theory, and it has been recognized as hopeless for, by just about everybody for 50 years and more. Uh, certainly in the 21st century, there are hardly any Cartesian dualists left around, two substances, the mind and the brain. Rather, we think that the brain, it is the mind. The mind is what the brain does. It's a material organ, just as your lungs and your heart are material organs, and we have to explain all the goings on in the mind in terms of the interactions of those material parts, those 86 billion neurons that are attached to each other and sending all those signals. How do we, how do we in this democratic society build humane and efficient institutions that can attract the affection and the loyalty and the commitment of all of us no matter what our powerful thing? Boy, that, that is a great question, Bill, and, and it's one that I am trying to answer. And I think the answer may well be, let's use the churches. Indeed, let's use the churches. But let's understand that we're going to use all the churches. And we're not going to tolerate the enforced ignorance of the young in those churches. They Are you can, in support? They can teach what they want, but they've also got to... If, think, of, think of the transformation it would be in the Islamic world if young Muslims were taught about the history of Christianity, the history of Buddhism, the history of Hinduism, the history of Confucianism, the history of Islam. The history of God. The history of all of those, and the history of, of atheism too. Think of what that would do to Islam. Think of what it would, think of the transformation of Islam, and including the girls in the education. How can, how can we not press this forward. Is the Lee Smolin theory about universes too. We're gonna to do it again until we get it right. That, that, that whole universes can in effect be uh, rough drafts, semi-rough drafts, penultimate drafts, and so forth, that there can be a process of evolution of universes. And at first when you encounter this idea, if you're like me, you're sort of cross-eyed and you think this is just too extravagant. There can't be any way of taking this seriously from the point of view of science. And that's an important point. We, you know, I'm a philosopher, I'm not a scientist. And one thing I know is that imagination is cheap. We philosophers are, love to invent imaginary universes, possible worlds, and think about what's possible and what's not possible. But we're stuck with uh, rather crude tools in a certain way, and that beyond l brute logical possibility, which is a very weak notion, we're not very good, and we, we don't have any way of keeping ourselves honest. Many people thought of evolution before Darwin. He was not the first person to think of evolution by natural selection, but he was the one who figured out how to bring the empirical demands into the picture in such a way that you had to take the idea seriously. Now, Lee Smolin has done something which I would not, before he wrote, thought possible, and that is come up with the physics that at least requires you to take seriously the idea, which is not that hard to imagine, that there could be an evolution of universes themselves, that there could be an evolution of the very laws of physics that makes biological evolution possible. That doesn't mean that he's shown it's possible. But he has shown that we have to take it seriously. And that's where 
You can't do that if you're just a philosopher. That's one of the limitations of our trade, is that we don't have the leverage to sort out the imaginable into those things that are imaginable and also that should be taken seriously. For that, you need, you need to make the game harder. You need to do some serious work so that people have to say, yeah, OK, that, that's a possibility we have to take seriously. Uh, somebody wrote me the other day saying, well, I've, I've, I've looked at your, your book now, and I think what you're really talking about in every case, you're talking about social thinking. You're talking about persuading others. It's, it's very much uh, interpersonal. Uh, and I wrote back and said, yes. And in fact, I should have stressed that more. All really serious thinking is interpersonal, I think. I think that's, in fact, one of the keys to how we think is by challenging each other with our ideas. Lovely case in point, Andrew Wiles proved Fermat's last theorem a few years back, but nobody could be sure, even Wiles himself couldn't be sure he'd done it until his peers, his colleagues in mathematics, who would dearly love to have the honor of having proved Fermat's last theorem themselves, until they had signed off and said, darn it, yes, he's got it, congratulations. This competitive opponent process between people is actually one of the key intuition pumps or the key thinking tools all on its own. And so this is a book very much about how to persuade others and yourself about difficult matters. They're also tools of discovery. By exploring these vignettes, you, you encounter either problems that you hadn't anticipated or sometimes opportunities that you would not otherwise notice. And they hold our attention. You, you can just refer back to them, and at least they give you a, a, a focus on a topic that's very useful. But many people still, millions of people still want house calls. They want to be able to know, believe that God has visited them. And what do we do about this? Because we, we all recognize that there's some borderline over which we don't, we, we don't know where to draw the line. Some people are just being deluded. They're being fleeced. They're being taken to the cleaners. They may be, they're giving their money to some charlatan, some faith healer charlatan. And if we know that, do we not have a moral obligation to speak out and say, hang on, do you realize that you're, you're being conned here? Now, if you do that, you may destroy somebody's precious illusion. And we shouldn't do that lightly. And I'm not calling on us to do that. I am saying it's a problem. And it's a problem because it creates a hypocrisy trap that we're all in. Hypocrisy trap. It was nicely exposed recently when Mel Gibson, a fundamentalist Catholic, blurted out in an interview in The New Yorker that his wife was damned. She was going to hell because she wasn't a, she wasn't a Roman Catholic. And that's, as he put it, that's what the chair says, and I go with what the chair says. And, and a lot of people were shocked by this. A lot of Catholics were deeply dismayed by this. Two groups of Catholics. Those that don't believe that at all, and just thought, this is, this is an embarrassment to our, our religion. And those who do believe it, but think it was very impolitic of him to say it. How many are in which group? Who knows? That's the hypocrisy trap. Right now, we have a Congress. Every single member of Congress believes in God. How many do you suppose really believe in God? Who knows? And sometimes they have the best of reasons for not saying what they really believe in. They'll get beat. They'll, they'll get beat. That's a, but there's even other reasons, too. I mean, there's, Granny would, it would break her heart to know that I've lost my faith. So you, button, so you button your lip. And so we're living in a world where there's just layer after layer after layer of hypocrisy. 
And I think we should start trying to cut through that. And we've got to break this cycle. How do we do it? Well, Ayan Hirsi Ali in her book gives a wonderful example of what broke it for her. And I was so glad that she mentioned it today. I already had this slide in here because I was going to mention it. It was a detail that just knocked me out when I read it in the book, Nancy Drew. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have thought that the Nancy Drew books would have been just dynamite to her? They gave her, as she said, tales of freedom, adventure of equality between girls and boys, trust and friendship. I want you to remember that and think about all the different sorts of Nancy Drew germs that you can spread around in different places. And it won't work for everybody. We want to spread thousands of different ideas of this sort, recognizing that all it takes is one of these to get into the right mind, and we've broken the cycle for one person. Maybe there's, an, there's limits to the things that we, uh, we are able to grasp. Maybe, well, but, but who knows? But, but, but wait a minute, you, don't know. You, have to, you, you have to appreciate, I think, that uh, it's not bra one brain at a time. Mm -hmm. right. right. It's teams of brains and all of science. I, Look, I, I'm sure without the benefit of, the, of thousands of scientists and philosophers who've worked over, over the eons, I'd be unable to understand all sorts of really simple things. The fact, the fact is that I can benefit from all their hard-won understanding means that I can understand things. I like to, to point out that, that my grandchildren can easily understand concepts that my parents' generation were baffled by. Yeah. Right. And now, of course, there may be limits, but it's not as if we're facing a stone wall somewhere. Mm -hmm. The idea that there's somewhere where there's this stone wall and we're just going to hit blank incomprehension when we get there, it's not biological, it's, it's mystical. It's the idea that there is no trajectory through book land and science land that gets you there. Some people believe in God. How many? It's very hard to say, actually, because some people believe in belief in God. And there are more people who believe in belief in God than believe in God. Well, how do I know that? Well, all the people who actually believe in God also believe in belief in God. I mean, I don't know about you, but I have not really encountered anybody who goes around saying, oh man, I just wish I could get rid of this belief in God. It's so embarrassing, you know. It's, it's, no. no, if you believe in God, you're proud of it. But then there's all the other people. So they all believe in belief in God. And then there's all the people who believe in belief in God, but don't believe in God. Well, what's the proportion? What's the ratio? We'll never know. Because those who believe in belief in God behave Exactly the way people behave who believe in God, except that they won't, say, run into a hail of bullets expecting God to save them. There aren't many people who believe in God that way. So we just don't, we can't tell. Maybe we're tiptoeing around and very few people actually believe in God. They just believe in belief in God. The trouble with the word consciousness, with the concept of consciousness, is that not only is there no agreed upon definition, People don't want to agree on a definition because a lot of people want consciousness to turn out to be whatever it is that is just so supercalifragilisticexpialidocious <laughs> that, that it defies science. <laughs> and, and anybody who puts forward a theory of consciousness which says, oh, and by the way, it's a biological phenomenon, it's... You know, it's very wonderful, it's, but then so is reproduction, so is self-repair, so is blood clotting, so is metabolism. Uh, for a lot of people, if you take that view on consciousness, you know, the, I often put it, you know, it turns out that consciousness is not one big trick, it's a bag of tricks. And it's not something that sunders the universe into the things that have it and the things that don't, you know. And the, the, the question, gee, I wonder if starfishes are, starfish are conscious, or maybe mice, 
Or maybe, how about ants or cockroaches? And they think there's this magic dividing line somewhere you know, between the oak tree and the human being where bingo, the consciousness starts. I think that very idea, which is deeply ingrained in the thinking of many people who, as I say, think that consciousness divides the universe in two. You either got it or you don't. Right, the idea and that suddenly I, the light goes and, on. And that idea is an artifact of bad imagining right there. And we have to get rid of that idea and we have to get people to recognize as long as you insist on that as, as a sort of a defining characteristic of consciousness, then you, you get your wish, we'll never have a theory right. of consciousness. But abandon that idea and start looking at what different kinds of consciousness or so-called consciousness or hemi-semi-demi consciousness. As soon as you start getting out of that essentialist mode and looking for the dividing line, then consciousness is a very real family of phenomena, not a, not a single phenomenon, a family of phenomena. Let's think about sheep for a moment. How clever of sheep to acquire shepherds. <laughs> what a smart move that was for sheep. Think of it. What did they do? It permitted them they could outsource all of their problems, their protection from predators, finding of food, health maintenance, all at a rather modest cost of some loss of free, main, of free mating. Was this a fitness-boosting move on the part of the sheep? It sure was. But of course, it was not the sheep's cleverness. Sheep are, as you know, not the brightest of animals. <laughs> Whose cleverness was it? Well, it was nobody's cleverness except it